And, um, colleagues that are beginning to join, this is uh, going to be the Southeast Asia meeting for an hour. So if you're looking for the Americas meeting, you need to go back to the lobby and make a different choice. Yeah. And Scott, are there three choices for them now in the lobby? So then you need to go get some coffee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Keep yes, there should be. So Scott from Zoom, um, there are, if people will go back to the lobby, I hope they can get three choices. Um, room one, the Americas. Room two is Afro for the first little while. And room three is uh, Southeast Asia. So this is going to be the Southeast Asia. You may need to go back to the lobby and choose the Americas meeting. And I was particularly thinking of my friend from Mexico that may want to join the, Mex the uh, Americas meeting. They have to really want to be here. <laughs> Same for Olga. I know you uh, represent, uh, what, El Salvador? You, you're going to want to go back to the Americas meeting. So, Scott, I hope there's three choices in the lobby right now. This cover slide looks like it's all the regional meetings, but this is going to be the Southeast Asia meeting for this hour. And a different on a I'm different on room is the America's meeting. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. I think, pe I think people are. Are you hearing me, Frank? Okay. I know you're hearing me because you're in the room, but. Well, no, but I can hear you on my computer. Okay, good. All right, so in about one minute, um, it's what? Three minutes after, we'll wait one more minute for people to uh, join. But once again, in room one on a different channel that you can get to from the lobby here of the Zoom events uh, platform will be the Americas meeting from three to six. On channel two will be the Africa meeting from 3 to 4.30 and the Europe meeting from 4.30 to 6. Everybody's willing to join any one of these. I'm just telling you if you want to go to your specific regional one. And the um, on channel 3 is going to be Southeast Asia for this hour, Eastern Mediterranean, uh, the second hour, and Western Pacific from the third hour from 5 to 6. So we'll start here in a moment. And this is uh, Tom Judd. And I've got in the room with me uh, my American colleague, Frank, Frank Painter, and Dr. Shankar Krishnan from IFMBE president is also with me right here. But if you want to go back to the lobby and go to a different regional meeting, this would be the time to do it. All right. Well, let's begin and uh, welcome uh, everybody. Uh, everybody knows, of course, that these uh, the Global Clinical Engineering Summit this morning from nine to noon, which was quite an experience, quite a ride, kind of like a roller coaster, I know, because we were trying to cover a lot of things in a lot in a short period of time and come up with some priorities from the profession across the world, which is quite a mouthful. Um, and then 
we um, and I've got the notes from that meeting this morning. And so I'll, I'll, I'll be looking over at the wall and looking at the flip charts and some of the notes to be a conversation starter here in a moment. Um, so once again, this is gonna be the uh, Southeast Asia meeting followed by the Eastern Mediterranean, followed by the Western Pacific. Um, so of course, between 12 and three, the next three hours after the sum global summit, global, global clinical engineering summit, we had three short courses. And now from three to six here in New York time, we're gonna have these various uh, six regions of the world as defined by WHO, the, the CE colleagues from the six regions of the world go a little bit deeper on the issues. And I, I'll start doing that in a moment. And on the faculty with me at the moment is, uh, uh, only um, our, our colleague who's very uh, strong, so he, he can carry the ball, our friend Baron uh, from Nepal. But, you know, we'll make allusion to other uh, things that we've learned uh, besides just the work from uh, Nepal. Um, and what else would I say? So, so some of you that are a little bit new to the CED work and you know we have a board and collaborator group that you've heard about that's um, today it's about 420 people from 165 countries but about you know 60 to 70 of us meet every month uh, typically on the fourth Wednesday for an hour and a half and we learn what's going on around the world and we catch up with uh, different different uh, things and different strategies in different places but anyway, out of that group, the board and collaborator group, we had three people that uh, spoke with uh, Calroy and I, the secretariat in late August, uh, trying to frame the issues for Southeast Asia, which is what this hour is about. And those three people were Baron from Nepal and uh, Dr. Jatinder Sharma from uh, India that I'm gonna refer to a bit more. And also uh, Mohammed uh, Ashraf Azaman from uh, Bangladesh, who's a uh, uh, academic, but also works with uh, at the Military Institute there in uh, biomedical engineering in Bangladesh in Dhaka, and um, you know is among the leaders of the uh, Bangladeshis. So we'll talk about Bangladesh a bit also in this series. So those of you, uh, so, so who who from Southeast Asia or what countries are for example, registered, many of you heard that we have, uh, maybe you haven't heard the latest, we're up to 1900 unique people ha who have registered for this Congress from uh, 114 countries. Well, the countries from Southeast Asia that are involved include Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Indonesia, Nepal, Vietnam, and uh, Myanmar. Myanmar. And so we're delighted about that group. Uh, so, so sort of to frame this, you know, it's a challenging conversation to talk about clinical engineering in a certain part of the world, but remember, remember, uh, Baron, uh, we asked three questions, um, of, of all the country representatives and there's more than you, more than just me. Um, I mean, I'm obviously I'm from the U S my point being, what are the issues for any country around the world? And we asked three questions for the, that we asked people to respond to today. What's happened the last two years that has changed how clinical engineering is operating in your country? And I'm gonna ask Baron that in just a moment. A second question was, okay, so clinical engineering perhaps maybe has gotten more engaged in the work and, and recognized nationally because it's had more impact, particularly during the context of COVID. So how, not only what's happened to the practice of clinical engineering the last two years, but what has, have you had more opportunities to engage with decision makers in your country, like the Ministry of Health or the WHO representative? And then our third question is what's sort of unique about clinical engineering in say Nepal or India or Bangladesh versus the rest of the world? So Baron, I know they're a little tired of me talking. Why don't you, uh, take a little bit longer than you were able to this morning and talk about how that's working in Nepal. You know, what's changed with clinical engineering? Are you getting to engage with your Ministry of Health more? And what's sort of different in Nepal versus the rest of the world, your estimation? Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tom. 
uh, talking about the clinical engineering field. Uh, in fact, uh, because of this COVID, uh, uh, we have got the opportunity to uh, get recognized because uh, now it came about the oxygen things and the oxygen related equipments that people get so much uh, uh, curious and uh, also kind of needy for these equipments and more sensitive uh, for these um, uh, biomedical equipments. And then government realized and uh, every sector in fact realized that there should be biomedical engineers and they felt the needs of the biomedical engineers. And then uh, uh, most of the biomedical engineers got engaged here um, yeah, mostly uh, for uh, for now, uh, uh, for the oxygen concentrators, uh, I think, and uh, later it came uh, a few months later, only came the oxygen plants and all. But uh, initially, the the most uh, um, mostly the, uh, the 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 concern uh, came about the oxygen concentrator, and there uh, there were uh, volunteers also uh, from the biomedical fields who started. Uh, to repair the uh, equipments, uh, mostly for oxygen concentrators, and then slowly uh, it became uh, about the uh, oxygen plants and uh, other equipments also like ventilators. Uh, so of course, uh, uh, before the uh, before this uh, COVID nineteen, people were not uh, so much aware. Maybe I, I can say if ten uh, percent. Uh, uh, were aware about the biomedical engineers and its role, it increased almost, uh, I can say, up to 60% that people uh, get uh, so much aware about. And even uh, if we talk about the hospital staff and the, uh, especially for the doctors, then most of the people uh, uh, came to know about the biomedical engineers and its role. So, uh, 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 and uh, then it, it, this is the two or three years in the uh, uh, here in Nepal, uh, people started, and uh, from the government side also, they started to think that uh, no, there should be biomedical engineers for um, accreditation and uh, like uh, for procurement also. Like uh, th there should be biomedical engineers who will be uh, authorized to uh, um, uh, to approve and uh, give the final decision for the for procurement of any biomedical equipment. So there has been so much changes came in these two and three years. And this COVID-19- Let me time you out just for a moment to sort of catch up what I think I've heard you say to make sure everybody's with you. So you guys have been around a while and I don't know if it was, yeah, you were saying this morning, you know, your program maybe in the public hospitals has been 10 years. So are you, yes. you're on the public side? No. Is there much private hospital system in Nepal as well? Yes, yes, of course. There are so much private hospital, and uh, if you talk about the, from the uh, ten years, then uh, in the beginning, uh, most of the biomedical engineers were engaged with the suppliers. They uh, start, uh, they, uh, their career uh, uh, has started with the um, uh, supplier, uh, medical equipment suppliers, and they uh, they started to like a kind of marketing, and then the uh, as a service engineer as a, a training givers for application engineer something like that and very few were engaged with the uh, public hospitals or the for the ministry of health i see and so they uh, started on the uh, private side but they've slowly merged yes. into the public side okay yes and then uh, and now uh, and now uh, major hospitals uh, almost though there is not so much uh, so many major hospitals in nepal I can say there might be uh, around 20 major public hospitals in okay. the whole country. And, and in and perspective, in, how many private? I mean, 100 or a bunch? How, how many, many private hospitals, perhaps? There are so many private hospitals, but if <laughs> you talk about the larger hospitals, larger private hospitals, sure, that's I can okay. say uh, uh, might so be... So maybe uh, hundreds, maybe you're saying. Um, no, larger hospitals, I can say maximum 15 to 20, but a smaller hospitals, if we count, then it, it might be thousands. Sure. Okay. Because then it may be clinics on, you know, on their way to becoming hospitals and that sort of thing. Anyway, and so your point is, in every city. you guys have been in the private side for a while, but because of COVID and other things, you began to also enter the public hospital space and around critical COVID equipment and particularly oxygen. 
So you are getting more and more recognition the past couple of years. Uh, uh, I can say, especially talking about only uh, for, uh, for me, I was actually involved for the government. I, I was working as a consultant, but I was also, uh, I was working from the very beginning for the public hospitals. Okay. So though I, I I was a consultant, I was working for the public hospital, but it's because of, because KFW was funding and it was a project. So this this was only one a large uh, huge project that uh, involved uh, engaged uh, five uh, to ten biomedical engineers uh, since 2011, and it okay. came um, uh, in 2017. I think. Um, uh, around 15 biomedical engineers were engaged in this project, but uh, except this project, uh, very few were engaged for the public hospitals. And uh, and I still there are so many that uh, those uh, are working still uh, for the uh, private uh, uh, suppliers. So, Baron, have you guys started a national society in recent years of clinical? Yes, uh, around a couple of years, uh, I can say I think uh, in 2012 or 13. Okay. We have um, a biomedical society here, but it's not uh, much active because uh, we all are uh, kind of uh, struggling for the for uh, uh, job opportunity and things. So sure. everybody is just uh, uh, trying so to. So you have a society, but part. it needs to be strengthened somehow. Yes. 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 And uh, did I hear you say something about uh, the need for credentialing or certification? Did I hear that? Or what, what? What would be your thought about that? Uh, about about certification, we have a biomedical uh, college here, so uh, the biomedical engineers all have the certification from the council, engineering council, from okay. the uh, government side, and uh, of course the college provides the certificate. And there is one biomedical technician uh, institute also who provides the, the certificate for the uh, BMT biomedical engineer technicians. Sure. But uh, 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 there are so many things that is still uh, needs to get uh, clear and we need to um, set the rules and regulations like if I, I would like to focus on uh, the decision making things that there are no clear distinction that who should be in the role of decision making like there are biomedical engineers who are just past and there are also with some experiences and some knowledge and- uh, But not often that, enough are you in the room with the head of the hospital helping making decisions just doesn't happen very much. Yes, that, that, that is another thing, but uh, I, I'm talking about the, from the government side, if uh, government is procure, procuring a CT scan or a larger equipment, and if uh, they have got one biomedical engineer who is fresher, he will not. He might not be able or competent to take decisions, and uh, and there is also something like uh, uh, supplier can influence, or those kind also uh, happens. So uh, government or any uh, um, uh, organization should take care of these things also. That uh, if we are uh, going to give a uh, give some kind of higher authority and the decision making authority to someone then we will have to take care that uh, whether uh, he or she uh, is um, uh, competent enough to handle that uh, decision making uh, role or not sure. if we don't have uh, we, if we don't have the options then it's fine but uh, it's not clearly defined that who will uh, start with uh, maintenance uh, uh, who will be uh, going to be uh, take the decision making roles. Okay. Well, thank you for that report. I'm going to give a brief overview of India, and I've got a colleague here that knows some things as well in the room. I mean, many of you know our colleague uh, and uh, Dr. Jatender Sharma uh, in uh, Visag Patanam uh, there in southern India, but he uh, created this uh, with government support the Andhra, Protect, Andhra Pradesh MedTech Zone, AMTZ. So this started in one of the what major provinces of India, but has really been nationalized since uh, over the last three or four years. And so, and the purpose of AMTZ in India, and I'm, I'm giving this an example of a actually about clinical engineering development in India, because uh, prior to starting AMTZ, which uh, let me quickly tell you, it brings many different medical device manufacturers together at the same location 
like 200 different manufacturers, mm -hmm. provides infrastructure for them and research facilities for them. But it'll, the government of India was trying to, is, is trying to and is succeeding in making medical devices in India so that they don't have to import so much. And so that, you know, and they provide high quality devices for their popula very large population. Um, and so that was the goal of AMTZ back in 2018. Uh, WHO hosted its uh, global forum there in December of that year. And I got to visit there with several others. Um, so what does that have to do with clinical engineering development in India? And it turns out it has a lot to do with it because, um, well, uh, before that, and Dr. Sharma is not the only person that represents clinical engineering in that country, but he represents really a global model that's very successful. Um, and what do I mean by that? So there's, of course, a Ministry of Health in India uh, that, you know, for the public side of the hospitals and for the public side of the population. There's also, as in Nepal, as uh, Baron was talking about, a very robust private hospital system. Um, and it's such a big place that's very complex and many challenges, but, and so I can't simplify it so much, but let me set, tell you two major things that AMTZ has done the last two years in the context of COVID. Um, so they had two years where they started to bring all these manufacturers together and then COVID hit. And so what have they done? Well, they've manufactured ventilators that got emergency use authorization from the government, three different models of it. They've, um, they produced intravenous testing devices. So, you know, lab, lab, I mean, PCR level testing as well as a home kind of testing of COVID. Um, they've, so IVDs, um, devices among devices, not only ventilators, but oxygen concentrators. And so they're, manu they're mass manufacturing them for their population, not only for their home population, but they're, they're sending them to countries around the world they are, um, they have manufactured PPE. Um, they, um, so one things they did with all the oxygen concentrators to get them to their population, there's 80 locations around the country of uh, India where they have um, warehouses and they have trained um, uh, clinical engineers. And I'll describe that a little bit better in a moment. And they send those oxygen concentrators to these warehouses and then they work with Uber such that, you know, um, individuals can rent an oxygen concentrator for basically $5 a day. And this is, this is uh, Jaitender talking, not me, but some low cost in the context of India so that private individuals can get, can rent for, you know, $5 a day an oxygen concentrator. So in the midst of all their, uh, worst part of the pandemic there, this was a service they provided to the population to make oxygen concentrators accessible to the population. And they've taken like the PCR, you know, higher level uh, testing of uh, COVID around in mobile vans so that there could, you know, be get the testing to the population that needs it in, you know, various urban and suburban locations. And so that a lot of powerful response. Well, in the credentialing context, one thing that they did was they created a, uh, what is the India Biomedical Standards Consortium, IBSC. So they basically defined five kinds of certifications for uh, in our field. And one was uh, biomedical equipment management, one was biomedical equipment maintenance, one was uh, project management, one was quality assurance, and one was manufacturing. So imagine five different certifications that people can go through a training and get the certification, then they get on a national registry of having those skill sets. And so you can imagine they did that in like 2018 to 2020. And so when COVID hit, they had people trained and ready to deal with different parts of the medical device management and oxygen management, PPE management needs across that very large country. Uh, and so that's one of the global models for certification or credentialing that's very interesting. And uh, Fr Frank Painter in the room with me here uh, led US certification for clinical engineers for years and I did for a while. And so, and, and then Fred, I mean, and uh, 
Frank trained many uh, master's level clinical engineers in the field and, and so forth. And, and to be ready for certification, to be ready to be very talented practitioners out in the field, because there was also an internship program associated with his academic um, preparation of many individuals. So anyway, and so we, are, we have this Western model of certification, but I'm suggesting that India's got this powerful um, model also on their part of the world for uh, certification. So that's some cool things about India. Um, our switching to Bangladesh for a moment, our colleague Anwar um, Hossein, who I don't believe is with us at the moment uh, from Bangladesh, it's probably pretty late at night, if not very early in the morning. So, you know, it's some of these meetings are tough times for people in different places around the world. But Bangladesh has had a very successful couple years uh, what Anwar was saying this morning, and I'm looking at the notes from our uh, meeting at the Global CE Summit this morning, is that they have gained um, Ministry of Health recognition the past couple of years. They've got an educational system that's training many young biomedical engineers that are, want to serve as clinical engineers at the point of care with patients. They've uh, launched their National Society, which is pretty active and pretty powerful. Uh, they've done Part of why I'm acting like I know a lot is because I'm on their WhatsApp group <laughs> and I see their dialogue every day and they, they have a lot of training going on of clinical engineers and technicians in the country. Uh, they have worked with PPE like remember, you know, if you'd asked me two years ago is personal protective equipment, how much is that a part of clinical engineering, I would say a little bit but not very much but WHO. The World Health Organization has defined PPE as part of our scope of work now so. We, we're more and more involved, and they, they're very involved in the oxygen supplies for their country, and not just oxygen concentrators, which are important, but the creation of these PSA plants. It's like the oxygen product, large oxygen production plants, and so they're very involved in all of these kinds of activities, and uh, we're, we're very thankful for the work in Bangladesh. So those are some of the models in Southeast Asia. Um, what have we said in CED? You know, CED is not about making, uh, you know, our global federation, you know, more special. You know, Global Clinical Engineering Alliance is not about gaining fame for us. It's about creating tools that help the national societies and the national groups of clinical engineers to be successful. And by the way, I think I said it this morning, maybe you were all there, maybe some of you weren't, that when I say clinical engineers, i I really want to broaden that to say um, uh, clinical engineering practitioners. And by WHO definitions, that's traditional, maybe master or higher level, uh, you know, biomedical engineering trained in individuals. It's also health technology managers, as we also call them in the United States, um, that, you know, may not have the four year degree or, or graduate work, but is, are very experienced individuals and the, you know, biomedical equipment technicians. Uh, so all of those are clinical engineering practitioners, and we really care about the education and ongoing training for that whole set of people, although we focused on the, you know, the degreed engineers a bit more, but we, we care about all of them. Uh, so the issues that, so why do we tell the stories of Southeast Asia, you know, Bangladesh, in this case, um, uh, Nepal, and uh, India, and uh, well, and we also heard this morning from Bhutan, uh, um, Tashi Pinchor is uh, as many, some of you know that name, Tashi, T-A-S-H-I, is a um, clinical engineer in the Ministry of Health, Bhutan, and uh, several of us met, you know, these individuals a few years ago in the U.S. at a big program that we did with the American College of Clinical Engineering. Um, so Tashi is a clinical engineer that's been, as you heard me say, in the Ministry of Health, um, Bhutan, and you know they've created a national society there. And we we heard some more. Um, I'm trying to see. He he talked about training. He talked about the work with Ministry of Health. He talked about getting involved in uh, supply activities, supply chain activities, as Baron was talking about, and also about certification needs. So how would we define quickly the um, certification needs around the country or around the world or the, what we also call the credentialing needs. And it's basically, 
you know, we, we broke it into four issues. Um, we want to have enough of the appropriately trained people with the right education and the right experience and practice. That's what we call the body of knowledge and the body of practice so that we can continue to build that capacity. Uh, you know, part of the capacity is to do maintenance of certain medical devices. It may be to build the capacity to do more work with oxygen, build the capacity to do more work with PPE, more work with high-tech equipment, um, the CAT scanners that, you know, have been mentioned. Uh, so building capacity so there's enough of people and so that, you know, when the pandemic struck Nepal, did Nepal have enough of people with the right capacity to address the issues that the health system needed at that time. So we talk about capacity building is one of four issues. The second one we talk about is, well, are we, if we had the close to the right number of people, were they given enough authority to do some good work and have they made an impact? And were, was that impact recognized by the Ministry of Health? Well, in some places, yes, some places, no. Clearly in India, it's being very recognized in Nepal, I think we heard that it's being increasingly recognized. In Bhutan, more recognized. In Bangladesh, clearly, you know, the minister has started to say we need to get more of these engineers and technicians. We, you know, they have to have the appropriate training. We think we have the right sources for that training and education. So there's an increasing amount of impact and recognition by the ministry. So that's the second issue. First issue, uh, capacity building. Second issue. Um, measurable impact uh, at, at, by and recognition by the Ministry of Health, by the decision makers in healthcare in the country. The third issue is, okay, if, if we got enough of the right people with the right backgrounds, if we have, uh, are, they're making an impact in important areas like we've seen clinical engineers make in many places during COVID in particular, are they helping set policy for the country? In policy maybe around regulation, maybe around purchasing, you know, of equipment, you know, are they involved at the right ways in policy making with, with their uh, decision makers, healthcare decision makers in their country? And lastly, the issues that we've identified in many countries around the world, we CED that we want to help partner with the various regions is that credentialing issue. So do, are the people, I mean, if you're getting more and more people and they're making an impact and they're helping to define policy, do they meet certain minimal requirements? Um, and can you, can you assure that they meet those requirements by having them go through a credentialing program? So I think we're seeing evidence of that in Southeast Asia. Um, so one of our approaches at CED to come alongside and partner was to, at the end of August, we brought together Barron, we brought together Dr. Sharma, we brought together the gentleman I mentioned from uh, Bangladesh, and we said, you know, what do you need? What's next? How can we help? And I think the answer, um, and I don't remember it perfectly, was that Dr. Sharma was saying in India that he wants to partner with his other regional countries in that region. And so to kind of create a coalition of experts that can help each other, you know, in the different health technology issues in their countries. And so get, get the best minds together and you know, work together on these things and share resources, share thinking. You know, in some ways, that's what national societies do. But some of these issues are bigger than you know. This, you know, some societies are you know got a lot of energy and a lot of backing and a lot of help, and some don't. You know, and Baron, you were saying yours is, you know, hasn't had a reason to be working together as well as it could, and that's not anybody's fault. That's just the way it is. But maybe if, maybe if uh, the country. So clinical engineers work together, as uh, Dr. Sharma was suggesting, on you know various projects that would enhance you know the status and and create more impact. And so that's that's some of the thinking I think that this group of uh, clinical engineering leaders from three of the countries in the region were thinking. Baron, did you have you had any thoughts about what Dr. Sharma was saying since uh, he said that a few weeks ago? I mean, do you? How easy would it be for India to partner with Nepal, you know, and so forth, do you think? Uh, there is so many possibilities. Actually, Jitendra uh, Sharma, he has a, a, a very good vision and very uh, long and very uh, strong experience and uh, um, knowledge about uh, regarding this field. So if he take any initiation regarding this, of course, 
i think uh, he, uh, we will be with him uh, and uh, there might be some uh, major changes and uh, uh, fruitful outcomes if he will start then of course uh, he will get the support and uh, actually i am willing to um, if there is anything then i am willing to collaborate with him and of course he can a uh, manage to uh, 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 to uh, create a, a, a nice group and team and he has a very uh, good and brilliant uh, team leading capacity so he can lead the team and uh, we can have a fruitful outcome sure very good i i'm going to say something practical about what he said uh, um well one that you heard me talk about all these statistics about the great stuff that AMTZ did and stay on the mic, uh, Baron, because I'm going to ask you something. But for example, he took those those 80 warehouses where they sent the oxygen concentrators so they could, you know, people could rent them with Uber. He also created and, and then he got all these individuals certified across these different categories I mentioned. Um, that ended up on a registry of certified people in his country or yeah, certified people around quality or project management or health technology management or maintenance, health technology maintenance or manufacturing support like a field service engineer, maybe from a manufacturer or a manufacturer design person maybe. Um, so those individuals worked out of those 80 warehouses, particularly the ones for HT management, the engineers or the technicians, and were able to repair uh, you know, the oxygen concentrators that India makes, but they also, you know, India, bit, once again, a big place, so many imports of uh, you know, various uh, COVID-related medical devices, and they, so the countries that get many countries gave, I think a few hundred thousand oxygen concentrators to India, and those are being the warranty periods and the service for those are being done by these India credentialed engineers out of those warehouses. So, you know, it's created this resource set of resources that is very wonderful for our profession. And, you know, maybe that kind of capability can be extended to Nepal and, you know, Bhutan and, um, you know, do things similar in Bangladesh. Now, you know, I'm from the U.S. and that does, that means I don't really understand the politics of Southeast Asia. And so I don't know who can't work with somebody else because of, you know, the wrong politics. But maybe, you know, maybe we clinical engineers can rise above those kinds of challenges. I don't know. W one thing I know that Jai Tinder did, they, even though their country needed a lot of concentrators, they were able to give some to Indonesia. They were able to give some to Thailand. Um, and so they've been very generous uh, in their, you know, and this, is, this isn't just Jai Tender, this is, he has the resource and his government makes the decision to give some of those to these other countries, some of them in the region, some of them outside the region. Um, oh, I know what I was going to ask. So one of the things we said this morning that's kind of unique about the profession is that we're very involved in digital health. And uh, I want actually my two colleagues in the room to talk about their thoughts. Um, but I think, you know, we just had this short course on digital health education. And so we can help each other develop digital health tools to help our populations. But uh, Dr. Krishnan, you may have some comments related to all that. And introduce yourself. Uh, hi, are you able to hear me? No, you are, but how about uh, our friend Varun, right? Is that the right yes, pronunciation? I, I can hear you. Yeah, you can hear me well, right? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, because our friend uh, Tom, hey. I'm, <laughs> okay, I, I, I'm originally from Bombay, right? But, uh, well, I thought I will give you some useful information. I'm in Boston right now. Uh, I'm the president of the International Federation for Medical and Biological Engineering. It's called IFMBE. Oh, that's our and yeah. yeah, that is the uh, clinical engineering division is, you know, one of our division. And uh, our friend, uh, uh, Mr. Tom Judd is doing a fantastic job in the clinical engineering division. And we have a distinguished colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Frank Painter from the neighboring state. I live in Massachusetts. He lives in Connecticut. Uh, 
you know, I thought I would give you something which can be realized quickly. Uh, you have paper and pencil to write something down. You can also put it in the chat. Well, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 So this is. I'm going to give you the name of a a doctor who trained. You know, he's originally from Nepal, but then he's in Boston now, right? Uh, he also trained, he did postgraduate training at Harvard Medical School. Uh, his name is Professor Adarsha Bajracharya. Okay. Adarsha, A D A R S H A. Bajracharya is B A J R A C H A R Y A. Right? Does that sound like a Nepali name? Or you only know Manisha Kuraila. Right? You know the name? You're smiling now. Yes, of course. <laughs> All the time it looks serious. Okay, anyway. Yeah, Badrachare uh, is also very much uh, known okay. to me. I so he, he, he's, an, he's an MD and he's in US right now and he does go to Kathmandu quite frequently. He is also interested in telemedicine. And recently, he has been made uh, the co-director of a project called Hospital at Home. And I think you are connecting with him. Later, if you write to me, my uh, email is S as in Sam, M as in Mary, S-M, Krishnan, K-R-I-S-H-N-A-N at gmail.com i will send you his contact number and see since he is originally from nepal and he's a medical doctor you know he would be more than willing to help you and he's very knowledgeable about telemedicine he's an expert he has come to my university and given lectures on telemedicine and as i said because of covid you know, in fact, one time he was giving a lecture from a field hospital. You know, they created field hospitals. So he should be able to give you a helping hand. Okay. And write down this also hospital at home. This is a relatively new initiative. And this has become more prominent due to COVID. So he would be able to give you some pointers. He may have real contacts right in. Kathmandu right away, you know, so you can get something. And he's also a very nice person, extremely nice person, willing to help. So I would suggest, you know, uh, make use of this information uh, to get you in good connections. And I also happened to attend a United Nations high level political forum uh, when we were talking about something called open science. It looks like uh, Nepal is very much interested in opening up uh, in terms of exchange of information and so on. So if you need information with respect to education of clinical engineers, you can write to uh, any one of us. Okay? We will be very delighted to give you information. Uh, personally, I have trained people from you know, technician level to undergraduate level to master's and PhD and postdoc levels, you know. So it may be able to give you some help. You know, you said you went to university, they're offering a program there, uh, but this field is dynamically changing. You know, it has to change. So you please, uh, you know, contact for any information you may need, okay? Uh, it is challenging without resources and without approval from policymakers, it's not easy. You know, however, I'm very pleased that in the middle of the night, you are awake and you are interested in you know, uh, participating. So thank you for your participation. Give our best wishes to all of our clinical engineering uh, community right in Nepal. Okay, Dr. thank you. Dr. Krishna, can you- Thank you, Krishna, and sir. Thank you. Uh, and uh, in fact, in fact I'm not- uh, I, Vajracharya. Now, after CHA, there's an R and YA. Yes, yes. Uh, Vajra, I, I know. I know. I know very well. Okay. Oh, he, you, you know that, right? He's smiling. 
But I tell you, you only knows Manisha Karela. You know, nobody else is out there. <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding. It just happened to be. I mean, she may be very old now. You know, I remember. That tells you how old I am. <laughs> see, I like to see you smile. Uh, we've Thank got you. one other great surprise for you. Uh, Dr. Manish Kohli is here, and he's going to tell about a digital health initiative in India that could spread across the wider region. Dr. Kohli? You all your yeah. We're turning down our audio because we're too much for our friends next door. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, we were trying to yell all the way to India. It wasn't working. I see. I see. So we have uh, uh, Barun from Nepal online. And several friends from other places. Okay. All right. Well, greetings, everyone. And thank you for staying up so late. Uh, I think uh, we've all realized uh, that COVID, for all the tragedy, has been an awakening moment for everybody. Uh, and I think uh, when I look at the Indian subcontinent and I look at the work that's being done, not only in India, but Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, th there's just a lot of momentum that seems to be building around looking at new ways of uh, addressing some of the complex challenges that exist in the, in the ecosystem. The uh, the challenge in that part of the world is that did we lose everybody? Power outage? Yeah, I think so. I just touched this button. Uh, I don't. I didn't change it. So I just yeah, turn it right off. I think we've lost. Yeah, the internet connection is on. I can see you. So okay. can you see me? Uh, yeah, I can see you on the internet. Can I can I still speak? And can you still see me? Uh, I can see you, but I don't see him. Okay. But I, I'm seeing you through internet. So okay. So I think uh, that didn't get turned off. That's on. Can you hear him? I mean, uh, but is he the only one on? Is anybody else on right now? For some reason, I cannot see the number of attendees and uh, you know, okay. So if there may be an echo, but speak now. Hello. If keep going. Okay. If folks are on, we are not able to see you, right? Well, we'll keep going anyway. Okay. They can minutes. see you, so you. Go they can see me. Okay. All right. Apologies, we've had a technical issue here. Um, so, so what you see is is now uh, a lot of momentum that's building up in terms of looking at solving uh, and addressing some of the complex challenges that exist. And one of the great opportunity that exists in the subcontinent is really to think about how we architect uh, digitally an ecosystem that leapfrogs uh, some of the mature uh, economies uh, in the West. And this is where uh, we've seen in India, for instance, the government has been uh, 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 pushing some pretty uh, uh, significant uh, regulations that are going to foster uh, uh, digital adoption, but also coverage of a large number of uh, Indians who currently do not have access to healthcare. And what this means is that uh, as we begin to think about a digital infrastructure, we have to think about a number of things at, at fundamental levels. First of all, capacity building. Uh, to build a digital infrastructure that's going to serve the needs of the healthcare ecosystem, we have to think about standards and how do we actually begin to build uh, uh, data standards that are going to uh, facilitate health information exchange across uh, the region. And, and so, so really having uh, standards defined uh, at the country level as to what meaningful health information uh, exchange looks like, but also then investments uh, in that infrastructure are going to be really important to connect uh, the entire ecosystem so that the patient is able to get care regardless of which institution the patient um, ends up seeking care in. Uh, second uh, uh, is, is the sheer digitization and the infrastructure that's needed in health systems. Now, now, the reality is uh, 20 years ago, uh, when the US started its journey on digital uh, adoption, uh, we were focused on a more uh, a server-based system where data centers uh, and, and fixed infrastructure required a lot of investment. 
this day and age, we can actually begin thinking about cloud-based solution, which provide uh, software uh, as a service. And, and this can help create economies of scale and reduce cost uh, per user. So really looking at funding models uh, that democratize access to technology infrastructure uh, and technology itself. Um, uh, we've all seen the power of mobile technologies uh, uh, that exist in the developing world. Uh, 30 years ago, uh, 40 years ago, uh, the developing world actually skipped over building a land-based telecom infrastructure and, and built a mobile infrastructure that is uh, better in many cases than uh, uh, many of the developed nations. Uh, and I think this is kind of the moment that exists in healthcare. So really fundamentally looking at investments in the right kinds of standards and technologies and infrastructure to enable that is going to be important. Uh, and I think there are health systems that are uh, beginning to uh, 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 build investments. I can name a, a number of uh, health systems in India that uh, are leading the pack. You have uh, LV Prasad Eye Institute in Hyderabad that has done a phenomenal job of uh, not only building a technology infrastructure and digitization, but then actually leveraging data to improve health outcomes. They have roughly 250 eye clinics across uh, India, but also in uh, Asia and Africa, uh, and connected to a secondary and a tertiary care center for eye care. And, and some of the outcomes that are coming out of uh, that network are unparalleled. Uh, they, 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 they match uh, some of the leading institutions globally. Uh, we have other systems uh, in India also that are on a similar uh, journey. I think the other piece that really is important is workforce development. Uh, we are going to need people uh, uh, in technology, in healthcare, uh, and not healthcare, not just doctors and nurses, but really the entire uh, gamut of uh, workforce, including clinical engineers, to really come into the fold and help move the uh, the dot uh, uh, in in the in that direction. Uh, so, uh, looking at what kind of training programs are needed and what kind of skill gaps currently exist, and how do we begin to uh, look at certification programs that are going to uh, upskill uh, the entire workforce? Um, I understand uh, uh, from talking to Tom and Yadin that there are uh, over eight hundred thousand clinical engineers globally. And that's an asset that we need to uh, uh, tap into and leverage and, and really begin to think about leapfrogging models of care. So, so really what I'm very, very excited about and I, and I am very uh, bullish that a, a leapfrogging solution will come out of some of the developing economies is a digitally connected distributed model of care where we begin to look at building critical care capacity, which is hospital-based, but then not really focusing on building a large number of hospital beds, really thinking about uh, investment in secondary care and primary care and home-based care. And all of that is connected uh, digitally and centered around the patient. And I think if we are able to manage a uh, patient uh, in, in a care setting where it is the best for the patient, but it also is, is most cost-effective, that is what a future-facing healthcare uh, ecosystem would look like. Uh, it's not a small uh, task, it's, just, it's, a it's a big journey, but think about having a conversation uh, like this 20 years from now. And, and we see that Nepal and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and India and other parts of the world, Africa and Latin America, have actually been able to uh, 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 leapfrog in healthcare. That I think is what success would look like. And there are examples that exist right now when you look at uh, uh, a country like Rwanda, they have partnered with a leading drone company uh, and a telehealth company. And as a result of that, they're able to provide critical blood supplies to uh, uh, patients who need it uh, just in time. Uh, so rather than waiting decades to build roads and bridges and, and infrastructure to provide that level of uh, uh, need, uh, they're using drones to deliver blood supplies uh, within 20 minutes of a request. Similarly, uh, through telehealth, every Rwandan now has access to uh, a doctor for a dollar a visit. That does solve all the problems? No. But when you have nothing and you're able to have access to a daughter, that's transformational. And I really believe, and this is my last point I'll make, is the, the secret is not in perfection. The secret is getting started. I, uh, this is the moment. Uh, COVID has taught us some hard lessons. Uh, we are only as good as our weakest link that we must begin the journey 
uh, uh, at the smallest level and, and begin to make incremental progress, uh, that's what great transformation will look like. So I would urge all our colleagues on this call, but all of the 800,000 clinical engineers, please be the champion of change. We need you. Look around your ecosystem and see what's needed. Reach out to us and 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 uh, ask us to help uh, build bridges and ask us for help and and uh, we want to be a part of your success. So thank you. I uh, I, I think this is a, an amazing event, uh, uh, connecting everybody uh, uh, globally this way. You know, if we can hold a conference uh, digitally connected manner, why can't we do healthcare? Thank you. So great, thank you, Dr. Coley, a uh, medical doctor that's uh, very involved with CED and GCEA. Who, uh, and uh, he's kind of shy. Not, no, he's not. Uh, but he was uh, the board uh, chair of HIMS International, and it's 110,000 members. You know that does health IT ex excellence around the world. And so what he says is very, very true. Um, we are running out of the, this hour, and this is the uh, regional room that is next hour going to work with Eastern Mediterranean, uh, Middle East, North Africa. So uh, any final comments or any questions from anybody in the, in the group? So we've tried to paint a picture of what's happening in the Southeast Asia region. <laughs> Unfortunately, we were painting that picture when it was, at, when it was one or two in the morning in, actually in Southeast Asia. So. It was very difficult for many of those folks to join us, but I think it's been a, a positive conversation. Any, any closing comments from you, uh, Baron? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Manish, or whatever he said. And uh, in, um, in Nepal, actually, uh, there is uh, the uh, require so Baron, requirement. I, uh, we see you. For some reason, we're not hearing you. I'm not sure why. Hello? There we go. Can you hear me? Now we see you talking, but I'm not, not sure what happened. But hello. Uh, hello. Let's see. Of course, I'll probably turn off. Hang on a minute. We we might have done something in the room. Maybe the others can hear you, and I can't. Oh, the others can hear him. So can you can speak now, Baron? Okay, okay. So whatever Manisha well, has said- I'm glad the others can hear you. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. It didn't work out for us. Uh, okay. In fact, in, in, in fact- uh, Anyway, we're gonna close this session now, but thanks for everybody uh, joining with us. All righty, bye for now. Goodbye. Okay, Brian, we'll do something with that. It's shut us down one other part. Sort of shut us down. The other, we couldn't see them.